or across disability. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about who Color Across Disability is as an organization, and then Julie will be speaking about Medicaid and the current assessment process uh, and the upcoming changes. And then I will be speaking about ways to stay involved or get involved and next steps. My name is Mona Vies, and I am the project manager uh, for Community Centered long-term services outreach. My background is in project management, management from both uh, for-profit and nonprofit spaces. And I joined uh, Colorado Across Disability Coalition or CCDC in June of 2021 to specifically work on this project uh, for the upcoming changes and the new assessment tool, person-centered budget algorithm and case management redesign. And something that I've learned um, in the last six months is how universal uh, challenges are for people with disabilities. In my own family in India, on both sides of the family, I had relatives who uh, went blind late in life and on my father's side, my uncle could no longer work and my aunt had a high school diploma. So she didn't have the uh, uh, necessary skills to be gainfully employed. So it was a real challenge for them. And on my mother's side, my grandmother went blind also late in life. It wasn't until she fell and, um, injured her hip that she couldn't walk. So my uncle made her a cart made of wood and four wheels so she could use her hand, hands and arms to um, move around. So I know that was a challenge for her. So I think uh, some of the challenges that people with disabilities face are, are universal and an organization like Colorado Cross Disability Coalition would have been very helpful. And what does Cross disability mean. Uh, cross disability um, means that individuals with different kinds of disabilities have more in common than not. We are a statewide membership organization, and membership is free to individuals who support our mission. We've been around since 1990, and the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed on July 26, 1990. So at that time, CCDC uh, wanted to make sure that the uh, there was compliance with the ADA throughout the state of Colorado. Over the years, um, we've grown into advocating for social justice for all Coloradoans with seen and unseen disabilities of all ages. And we use litigation to advocate for social justices um, such as education, housing, healthcare and health equity, transportation, employment, and income security. We also have extensive experience in advocating for client-friendly Medicaid policies. And Julie is going to speak more to that uh, in just a couple of minutes. What I do want to mention is that it, this project that I'm working on is so important because it impacts every person in Colorado. And it was our members who came to us and said, this is not working. And so we decided to make it a focal point and create its own project. And so um, as part of this project, we're creating an army of advocates. And I'll be speaking more about that when I uh, speak about the ways to get involved. So I, um, and one last point is that if you'd like to learn more about who we are 
and learn more about any of the topics, please visit us on our website um, listed here and we'll also be uh, sending all of the information and the links out in, um, in an email following this presentation. Also, um, Facebook or Twitter. And at this point, I am going to turn it over to Julie. Thank you so much, Mona. Um, and thank you, thank you for the perspective and reminder how universal um, our humanity is. Um, that I think that was that was really important. Uh, I just wanted to note that in the chat, uh, Jose has posted a couple times now um, a sign up sheet, and please sign up on that, um, and um, so that we have your contact information. And by that, we mean your email to make so that we can make sure to get you any follow up from this meeting. So um, I don't know everyone on this call. I know some of you on this call, and I know that some of you know Medicaid, but I want to level set really quickly. Uh, Medicaid, as people uh, know, is a, is a big, complicated, but super important program. So we're not going to talk about all parts of Medicaid. We're only going to talk about one part. Um, but Medicaid is a program for both low-income individuals um, of all types, as well as working adults with disabilities who, thanks to the Medicaid buy-in program, no longer have to be low income. Um, and um, the reason Medicaid is so important to people with disabilities is that Medicaid and, and older people, is that Medicaid is the only funder of long-term services and supports. No, one, no private insurance funds it. Um, you know, for, for some very specific situations, maybe the Veterans Administration funds some things, but universally in, in the United States, Medicaid is really the only way to get these funds. So if you have a disability, whether by birth or acquired, that's significant, you're gonna end up on Medicaid unless you are super, super wealthy. Um, and so what are, when we talk about long-term services and supports, there's both institutional care, which we're, we're not really gonna talk about, um, but that home and community-based services or HCBS are the services that allow people with significant disabilities to live in the community um, with the necessary supports. And um, we will um, get into more of what that is. If you could go to the next slide, please. So um, when we look at Medicaid, there's uh, in, in the agency in Colorado, every the federal law says that every state must have a single state agency that is in charge and oversees Medicaid. And in Colorado, that agency is called the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, and it's referred to as HCPF. Um, but anyway, so if I use that acronym, I'll try not to use that acronym, but if I do, that's what I mean. So there's two sides of Medicaid. The first side is like what people think of with, with regular like health insurance or, and it's not insurance, Medicaid's different than insurance and it's better than insurance, but just regular medical care. And that's for people with and without disabilities. It includes things that everyone needs, like going to the doctor, like if you break your leg, going to the hospital and getting a cast, um, x-rays, uh, tests, those kinds of things. It also includes some disability specific medical care. So for example, um, a power wheelchair or um, extensive rehabilitation. Um, those are all part of the medical side of Medicaid. In Colorado, we also include mental health. And as recently as the past couple of years, we now also include substance abuse treatment. Um, yay, that, that's good news. Um, the other thing that Medicaid includes that's different than most insurance is that we pay for transportation to medical appointments. So, and that's, that's used uh, not just an ambulance, which you would use in an emergency, but for non-emergency transportation, um, we have a, a system that will either reimburse mileage or send a service to get someone for the type of transportation they need. And that can be anything from a bus to an ambulance that's equipped with life support and everything in between. We also have what we call a limited de dental benefit, and that's about 1500 a year of dent, not about, that is 1500 a year of dental care that people can get. We're not going to talk about that today. I just wanted to set the stage. We are going to talk about um, long-term services and supports, or LTSS, and that's non-medical services for the most part. There's two two. There, you know, we'd like to say there's a continuum, but it's really two pieces to that. 
One is institutional services, which is mostly in nursing facilities, but for a very few people, it could also be in what's called a ICF, um, an intermediate care facility. That's institutional care. We know that people with disabilities choose to live in the community and most of our services in Colorado are community-based. So that's what we're gonna focus on. And our community-based services are called home and community-based services. And um, they're provided through waiver programs, which I will talk about in detail in a minute. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So um, long-term services and supports, again, we have them for all ages. You can get them as an infant or you can get them in old age and everything in between. Um, they can be all kinds of assistance. So that could be physical assistance, like helping someone get in and out of the bathtub um, or, or giving someone a bath or feeding someone or preparing meals. But it can also include things like supervision or queuing. So someone might physically be able to take a shower, but they need someone to remind them that it's time to take a shower or to help them with the steps of the shower. Um, and so um, it, it can be homemaking, it can be transportation, it can be respite, it, all kinds of things can be long-term services and supports. But the important thing is that they're non-medical services. No. The other thing that's important is that you don't have to be housed to receive long-term services and supports. There's been a myth out there that people um, say, oh, well, you can't get these services if you're homeless or unhoused. That's not true, you can't. Um, you can get these services anywhere in the community. You can get them at work. You can get them at a friend's house. You can get them on the street. You can get them at a homeless shelter. You can get them in a tent. Um, you can get these services anywhere that you need them. Um, people also have to go through an assessment annually. And we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about that assessment. So if you can go to the next slide, I'm just going to go over the different waiver programs quickly. So... Um, a waiver is a program that provides some additional assistance um, for people with disabilities. Um, for people with disabilities to get extra services, and there are different income qualifications for waivers, um, either buy in or waiver qualifications. And we're not going to talk about the financial, but that's just part of a waiver. A, they call it a waiver, not because someone's waving their hands, but because it's a, a kind of a deal that was made between the state government and the federal governments um, to provide services outside of nursing facilities back in the days when nursing facilities were the norm. And we've just, we still call them waivers and there are formal agreements. So for children, the waivers are, um, of course, they all have acronyms because that's how we make things more confusing. Um, CLLI is children with life limiting illnesses. Um, and that is uh, not, in, in adult world, we use the word hospice, but not so much for children. You don't have to uh, forego curative care. There's no six month timeline and it could be any illness that, that could limit your lifespan. There's CES or children's extensive support. That's for kids that have such significant disabilities that they need kind of constant supervision throughout the day, well beyond what would be typical for their age. And often that they cannot sleep through the night and that they need care, you know, a couple times throughout the night or, or even more. Um, there's CHIRP, um, which is the Children's Habilitative Residential Program. And that is um, an out of home for kids that need out of home placement, although they are making that available under family caregiver now. Um, but that's again for the, the most severely um, disabled kids. Um, often kids with serious behavioral problems, but for kids, again, that need really kind of full-time awake staff. And the CHCBS is the original children's waiver, and that stand, just stands for the Children's Home and Community-Based Services Waiver. And that's generally for kids with a lot of medical issues. For adults, we have a bunch of different waivers. There are two waivers for people with developmental or intellectual disabilities. There's what we call the DD waiver, and that's 24, it's supposed to be 24 seven services that can be in a group home, a host home, some other residential or, fam, or in the family home. Um, but 24 seven services and oversight is expected in that program. And um, then we also have the supported living services, which is 
for the most part, people that are on the waiting list for the DD program, but if there, if there are some people in the DD system that don't require 24 seven, not, not many, but some. Um, and they also can get supported living, which is a bunch of other services, but not 24 hours a day. Um, and then for the rest of the population, there's the brain injury waiver for people who have had a traumatic um, brain injury. Um, there is the uh, community mental health services waiver for people with a major mental illness. There's the spinal cord injury waiver, which unfortunately is still not statewide. It's, it's Denver, the Denver Metro, the Front Range area for people with spinal cord uh, injuries. And then there's the elderly blind and disabled waiver, which is kind of for everyone else. And that's for people who are over, either over the age of 65 blind or disabled you disabled either if you have social security, disability, or SSI, or if you don't, and you don't have to, there's still myths out there where people say, oh, you have to be on SSI or SSDI, you don't. You just do a state level disability determination if you don't have those particular benefits. I know I just said a lot real fast, but I'm gonna keep going. Um, next slide, please. So even though there are a lot of problems with the system that we have um, and we've asked for things to change, change is still difficult. And so um, we are, so it's really important for us, all of us, our families, our communities to know what services are available for people of all ages who have disabilities. And we're here to help understand how the process works, what the changes will be and how to involve others and yourselves with having the, the ability to see things from a statewide perspective, uh, what I've seen is that things are really uneven and what you get today determined is based on where you live and how much you know, and that's really unfair. So we've been parts of the state where there are whole communities that have absolutely, no one's told them about any of these services. They're really struggling. And then there are other, other places where if you know what you're doing, you can get a lot of your needs met. Um, and we feel like this needs to be a lot more equitable and a lot more transparent and a lot clearer and, and quite frankly, more fair. But that doesn't mean that change isn't gonna be hard and that we don't have to be super vigilant to make sure that things don't go wrong. And if they start going wrong, that we know immediately that they're problems so that we can immediately rectify them. If you go to the next slide. So, um, and the, the state has um, seen these slides. I think there are people from the state on this call. So they know what we're saying here. Um, and that's a good thing. Um, it, the purpose of these changes is not to cut services or benefits. So if things start, if that starts to happen, we need to know that immediately so that, so that we can um, address it immediately and stop whatever's happening and make any changes because that is not the purpose. That's not what the legislature authorized. Um, and so it's important that not only that we know that, but we tell everyone that this is not about cutting services. Um, and so we need to not just say that, but make sure that that, that, that doesn't happen. To make this system work for everyone, we need to increase flexibility and fairness and make sure that People can get the right services at the right time and the right amount. And that might change, that changes for all of us over time. So just because someone needs X amount of services today, next week, next month, next year, and five years, those needs might change. And we need a quick, easy way to get those changes done, which we don't have right now. We actually do have that in, in the non-developmental disability system, but in the developmental disability system, it's very challenging to get changes made. So um, I'm gonna ask if there's, um, I'm gonna just look at the chat. Um, if there are any questions, um, this would be a good time before we go on to talk about the uh, new assessment tool. And I'm not seeing anything. Um, so, okay. Um, there's, there's, uh, okay. Okay, so, um, okay, so here's, here's something from Betty. For people with IDD who are already in services mandated to take the new assessment, do they need to take both um, every year? 
The answer to that is no, there will be a transition and they will, it, it'll move from CIS to the new one once, once the new one is done. And I wanna be real clear, the new one is not is not complete yet. So, and then there'll be a full year of doing the new assessment before they start looking at the budget part. So until that budget part is done, the CIS will, will stay around, but they're not gonna have to take both. Um, and, um, the SPAL will be replaced by a more flexible budget um, budget algorithm um, process with an exception process. So, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So then, whoops, I just, so then the next says with the SIS, um, if the assessor and the family disagree on a score or a perspective within the assessment, the assessor's opinion overrules the parent provider. This is not objective. Will the same problem occur with a new assessment? Can an independent review panel be assessed when this occurs? Yes, and that's one of the reasons why we, why we wanna see something different is because A, the CIS is completely non-transparent um, and that's um, totally um, inappropriate and unacceptable. Um, so the, the so, um, that can't happen. Um, the CIS is non-transparent, and there has so there has to be an appeal of review. So we'll know with this, we'll know right away how how the data gets into the assessment. We'll be able to see everything that's written, and we'll have an immediate process to be able to say, no, you got it wrong, because it might just be a misunderstanding or it might be intentional. There's also going to be a lot more oversight um, from HICPUF, and we'll talk about how they're going to achieve that when we talk about case management redesign, because right now we're not even auditing the CIS. Um, so I hope that that makes, and hopefully this will make more sense as we go through. And then, um, um, sorry, there was, I thought there was one more question. Um, was no, there, was there a comment? Okay, okay, great. Uh, thank you, excellent questions. Can you move on to the next slide, please? So just to level set, well, yeah, we're gonna just kind of say, what is an assessment? Um, how, you know, how does that work? Um, and um, why is there a new assessment, uh, which we just kind of talked about, what does it matter? What are the benefits and what's involved? So- Actually, Julie, Barry Lehman, uh, continue with a follow-up question and it's kind of okay. long. Okay, okay, Betty, can you just unmute and read it? Cause I can't really see it. Hi Julie, currently, Hi. can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Only CIS assessors and HICPUF know what constitutes disability for medical support needs in the CIS assessment. For example, to qualify for extensive medical support needed, as opposed to some support needed, the CIS requires the individual be in a wheelchair, nonverbal, and on life supports, be eligible for the category of extensive medical support needs. Will the definitions the assessors use be available for parent review prior to taking the new assessment? Absolutely, they will be available for all of us to review. And again, we've been promised full transparency and, and CCDC is prepared to, you know, take a good all stops to, to shut it down if that doesn't happen. But we have no reason to believe that that's not gonna happen. Um, it, and, and so we will, we, as we get into this, we will talk about kind of how the transparency will happen. But yeah, the whole secrecy behind the CIS is one really big reason why we fought so hard to get rid of it. Thank you because that's, that's completely unacceptable, what you're describing, and but what we, the complaints we've been hearing for years. So, um, so an assessment is basically a process to, to learn something or to, to say, what, what's the baseline? What are the needs? Um, the reason there's a new assessment, we want a new assessment, you've just heard some of it about the SIS, and the SIS stands for the Supports Intensity Scale. And the reason for all of the problems with this is that we don't really have time to get into all of it. It has, it has mostly to do with how it was implemented in Colorado. And I wanna just say in defense of folks that are working at Medicaid now, none of them were there when this botched implementation happened. So it's, it's not their fault that it's such a disaster. Um, there were other people running things at the time. Um, 
but the other reason is so so we have one thing for people with developmental disabilities then we have something else for every, a different process for everyone else and then we have um, yet another assessment for children who get home health care I, I there's a bunch of other like little mini assessments out there it and, and so it's impossible to track to monitor to make sure people are doing it correctly and again a big lack of transparency <coughs> it's also too subjective um, and um, because it's not, it's not really detailed enough. Um, so that, so a group that involved a number of advocates worked for about five, six years on really working, really looking at a new assessment and really trying to figure out how do we get to the right questions. The other thing that's gonna be different is that all of the questions that you answer, except for things like obviously like your name, um, will, will be counted to determine what the, what your budget's going to be and what services you get. Right now with the CIS, they interrogate you for hours, but then don't use all of the information to determine how much support you get, which um, mm. doesn't make sense. So knowing, being able to get all of the information is really important because that, that, that's kind of getting into why does this matter? If we have a good assessment, we can really understand what people's needs are and then we can do a much fairer way to um, allocate money to these needs. Um, and, that, and that's also the benefit of having something that's transparent and involved and that everyone knows so that there are no secrets. Um, so that again, we have a transparent process. Um, and mm -hmm. even if we can't meet every single need, they'll at least, it'll at least be honest and open about what, what we can meet, um, what needs we can meet. So we'll go on to the next slide, please. Um, and I'm gonna talk about who's involved in a minute. Um, can, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. It, it's not moving. Okay. Um, um, Jose, can you deal with us, please? Thanks. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, hold on. Uh, okay. Oops. Uh, you want me to just do it? No, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I, okay. Okay, so there's two parts to this assessment. One is the eligibility part, and that's what they currently use. There's a, a, something called the ULTC 100.2 that people are probably familiar with, and that stands for Uniform Long-Term Care Assessment, and the two is because there used to be a one. Um, and so what people often panic because they'll hear things from case managers or other people that say nursing home level of care or hospital level of care. Don't panic, you don't ever have to go into a nursing home unless you choose to, which most people don't. Um, that language is just goes way back from the days when, when home and community-based was this kind of extra option instead of nursing homes, which used to be the norm. You do not, it's just a way to define who's eligible for these services. Julie, and, we yes. have a few comments uh, from Pamela. From Damien and from I, Okay, I will. We will get into the appeal process, um, and um, and yes, yeah, some this the, the the appeal process will be accessible to families, and I will get into that. Um, so thank you, Pam. Um, if if we can just, it, it'll come a little bit later, um, but not too much further. Um, and I'm glad that you're talking about appeals early because appeals are super helpful, and we need to be you know, advocating that because that's a really good way for the system to know what is and isn't working. If no one appeals um, or challenges decisions, then they their data shows that things are working. So in terms of the, um, the services, again, the, the assessment is a long process, um, a very long, it's a, you know, it's a long process to really identify, are you eligible and what are your needs? Um, and yes, the level of care language is outdated and it should change. Um, to be honest, I don't know if it'll change because uh, some of it is federal language um, and that's 
um, getting things changed at the federal level is a little challenging, but maybe we should try and figure out a way to change it in Colorado. That's a good point. Um, so anyway, the services, um, basically to be eligible for, to meet what's called nursing home level of care is you need to need assistance with getting through your day more days than not. You don't have to need it every day. You don't have to need it all day. It could be physical assistance or kind of cognitive or mental assistance. Um, and it, but those are the, those are the types of assistance. Again, it's really for people that need help getting through their day. Some people might only need help with, it doesn't have to even be personal care. It might be that you need to get door to door transportation to, to go to the, you know, go to, to go to your, your job or your getting around your, your community because you, public transportation doesn't work. It could be that you, you need homemaking. It could be that you need just like electronic monitoring or check-ins. It, it's just that you need that assistance. And that's really oversimplifying it, but that's, that's the gist of it. And the assessment also, part of why it's so long is it not only determines if you're eligible, which is kind of the easier part. And we did test the assessment to make sure that, that, that we weren't going to get people that are currently eligible and take them off. Um, and so we did a lot of testing on that, but we also, the, the, the assessment also will be helpful to identify what services and how much that you're eligible for. Right now, you kind of have to know what you want instead of really looking at everything that might be available. If you can go to the next slide, please. So, um, and we're gonna talk more about case management agencies later um, and why I'm using that word, but the case management agencies are, will complete the assessment and um, I just wanna be really open as someone who uses these services. Their presence and questions can be super uncomfortable. That's not necessarily, that's not their fault. Um, it, the process is very uncomfortable for those of us that have to go through it. Um, these programs are expensive. So, so the state um, and the federal government say, you've gotta you know, make sure people really, really, really need this. Um, and so they're, they're supposed to be there to help determine your needs and identify the next steps in the process. If they're not coming there in a helpful spirit, again, that's where you need to notify an advocate and involve us because that's not how it's supposed to be. And that's not what the state wants. They want to have people get the services they need at the right time and the right amount in the right place. So we need to know if that doesn't happen in any way, shape or form, but it is still uncomfortable to have to answer a bunch of personal questions to a stranger. If you can go to the next slide, please. You also get to choose who you want to be involved. Um, it, you can, um, we encourage people to have someone there. And let me explain why. Um, it, a lot of us with disabilities tend to minimize what our needs are because we get, used, we get used to it. And when we do that, particularly with this new process, we will be talking ourselves out of resources that we might need to maintain or even improve our independence. So an example is if someone says, um, yeah, I, I can get dressed okay, I don't need any help, but what they can do is put on sweatpants um, and socks, but not shoes or dress clothes. Having someone there who knows them who might say, yeah, but what if you need to go to work? Um, you're not gonna go to work just wearing sweatpants, are you? Um, or you know, if you need to go out, you need shoes and socks on. That can help. Um, so someone you know, if you don't have a friendly relationship with your case manager, you might wanna have an advocate. Hopefully with the case management changes, we'll have less of that, but you know, not, there's always opportunities for improvement. So having an advocate with you could be a good, a good, um, a good, a good suggestion. Some people like to have their caregiver with them, like the person who actually provides us service. Some people don't want them around. It's totally up to you who you want, it's also important to know that if you need an accommodation to do the assessment, you have that right um, to ask for that and to get it. So you might need a sign language interpreter. You might need um, uh, you might need to know if you have to sign anything to get that two weeks in advance. You might need that in large print. Um, whatever it is, you you just need to be able to think about that and ask for that ahead of time so that you get your needs set. 
Um, there's some stuff in the chat about some of the case managers are super polite and some are really not personable. And when you have a system with a lot of different people, that's probably to be expected. And hopefully we'll have a system where we can do better training, support, and monitoring um, to, to get to improve the quality um, and the consistency and for the case managers to give them the training and support they need to be their best. So um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so again, during the assessment, they're gonna, once this is, they're in the process of automating it, um, which has been a challenge and a struggle, but they're working on it. They'll have um, something where, where they'll be recording questions and you get to see everything they're recording. So there shouldn't be any secrets, um, but the questions are gonna be personal. Um, and again, it's super uncomfortable, you know, to talk to a stranger about like your toilet habits or like if, if sometimes when people fall, they get embarrassed about that or, if you haven't taken a shower for four days because it's too hard because you don't have the services, people don't want to admit those things. Some people are afraid that, oh, well, if they know how much I need, they're going to put me in a nursing home. No, they can't and they won't. Um, no one can put someone, I mean, without a court um, in, an, in an institution. So the, reason, the fact that you need these things or that maybe you haven't taken a shower or maybe your house is really messy, that says, that says that you need these services. So, but it's still, I can say this all day long. I know from having been through this process, it's really hard not to kind of be embarrassed or try and hide things. Um, and, and it's hard to talk about super personal things in front of someone you don't know well. They also ask about things that are, that are hard to talk about. Like, do you forget things? Do you have behaviors that get in your way? Um, and those are also hard to talk about. Um, they will ask questions about mental health. And if you're not asking for services around mental health, you, you only have to answer questions that you want services about, but some people with mental health issues do need services around their mental health. They might, it might be that the reason they need help going to the store is anxiety, not that they physically can't carry a bag or, or whatever. So it, we, we really encourage people to try and answer stuff honestly, have someone there with you, to support you and just kind of brace yourself that it's going to be a hard experience but it this is what you need to do to get the services that really help you stay independent and really be a part of your community and i was i use the word independent and that's probably not the right word it's really interdependent we all have things we need help with and we all have things we can give back and by getting the help with things that we need help with puts us in a better place to be able to give back whether that's by volunteering, by working, by caring for our kids, maybe by babysitting for a neighbor, whatever it is. Um, those, are the, those are the things that we, um, that we can get back on when we have our needs met. If we use all of our energy spending four hours getting dressed, we're not gonna be really helpful to others. So this is really about interdependence and how we are part of a community where we have a lot to give. Um, so yes, Betty, we need a training accessible to parents to help them understand. Um, and so, yes, that's, um, thank you. Next slide, please. And Julie, I think there's a couple of questions in the chat. Okay, thank you, Mona. Um, Actually, I've been monitoring. It was only the two that you already mentioned. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So um, they'll also ask about your goals and um, you can decide what you wanna answer about that. Some people, for, and, for, and you don't have to have a goal if you don't want one. Some people might have a personal goal, like, like it might be, I wanna stay out of the hospital this year, or I wanna gain some strength, or uh, some people might have a professional goal, like I wanna get a promotion or I wanna go to full-time work. Some people might say, I just, I, I don't really have a goal. I just want to keep my life the way it is. Any of those things are fine. There's not a right or wrong answer. They'll ask your routines and if you need for things to be a certain way. Um, and that's okay too. They'll also ask about what I say, what we call quote unquote natural supports. That means people who help you who are not paid. Um, it's really important when we answer these questions that we take into consideration when that we might be getting that, but when that needs to change. So for example, you might have, um, we, there are a lot of people in the state that have parents who are helping them and the parents are elderly and they, they can't keep doing what they're doing. Or you might, have, you might have a family member helping you 
And it might be that that family member is getting really burnt out and you're fighting all the time. They might be getting burnt out because they're trying to help you and work full time. And that maybe no one ever told them that they could actually get paid to do your care. Or maybe it's better for all of you if they go get, they go to do their job and someone else comes in and gets paid. Those are very personal situations that you have to discuss in your family. But just because you have a natural support, this would be a time to say if that is no longer working and that you need that to go to a paid support. Um, so uh, any, any true natural support should be reciprocal. Um, an example of that might be, for example, I have, I have a neighbor who's very kind and shovels my snow, but I also help him with, um, I, also, I also help him, he's a contractor. So if there's some city regulation or something, I can help him with that. So that's something that's reciprocal where I'm doing something and he's doing something. If I didn't get personal care and help with all of that, I probably wouldn't be in a position to offer that help. But we shouldn't expect people in our lives to just provide unpaid support all the time just because they're there. That, that's not appropriate. So when, when you hear about natural supports, that's what I want people to think about. Um, there was just a question um, that said, what if the client is uncomfortable and does not have an in-person support and they don't feel comfortable with the current case manager? So there, there's a, a few different ways to deal with that. If it's if it's really about the person, they can always ask for another case manager and that should be granted. And that, that can be without fault. You don't have to blame anyone. You can just say, we're not hitting it off. We're not communicating. I need someone else. Um, it, and of course, if they do something really bad, you should tell the supervisor so they can address it. But sometimes two people, there's no, there's no one person that can hit it off with everyone. You also want to ask, um, you also could ask them if they can't get in-person support to have an advocate on the phone um, or on a video call. We do that a lot because we're state, we're a very small staff and statewide organization. Those are the two things I can think of. Yes, they just asked the case management agency. So if you can go to the next slide. There's also a thing in this new assessment where you'll be given the opportunity, and I think there's gonna be both an online and a live way to tell your story some clients have said that they want to be able to do that, that they want to have kind of their, their, their story written about them and they don't want to keep telling it over and over. Some people are not going to be interested in that. This is also a place to include information that you want everyone to know before coming into your house. And I'll give you a few examples. Um, so, what, so one example might be if you have communication accommodations. If you, so if you need a sign language interpreter, we want some people or, or maybe that you need stuff in large print or you need two weeks notice to schedule anything. People get really tired of like asking and asking and asking and asking uh, like every time there's a new case manager or an agency. And as we all know, their you know, case manager turnover is, uh, is a big deal. Um, it, it happens a lot. So if you're sick of like asking again and again and you want something to stay, the system is designed that it should stick with you even if you change, you know, even if you move, as long as you're staying in the state, or even if the company changes, like, like happens sometimes where it's now not going to be company A, but company B who's doing the case management. Um, you can also include stuff that you want someone to know before they come into your house. Um, like I like people to know I have large, um, very exuberant dogs. Um, so if someone's afraid of large dogs, they need to not come to my house. Uh, some people um, are smokers and they don't want someone who is offended by smoke in their home. Other people have severe allergies and they don't want someone who's been smoking in their home. Those are all things that you can say um, in terms of, um, so you don't have to tell your life story. You can just say, before someone comes to the home, um, this is it. So Robin has a virtual meetings acceptable. Right now they are um, under the public health emergency and a lot of case managers are refusing to do anything but virtual. Um, but it, that at some point that will likely change. And, but we also say people can ask for virtual as a reasonable accommodation for a disability, um, especially now that you can do them with video. Um, so again, coming in, you know, they've coming into your home um, is that a requirement. 
the feds, but again, before the pandemic, the feds were saying, well, there has to be some face-to-face, -face, but again, we have gotten face-to-faces in neutral places for people that have a disability related reason. But now that we're all used to doing video meetings, um, we may be able to, um, we may be able to, to make, you know, we can still use that as a reasonable accommodation once things go back. I feel like I'm a little hesitant to say too much because we keep thinking things are going to go back to normal and it keeps not happening. So at this point, virtual is totally available. And I think we should all lobby to keep that available because a lot of people um, feel safer with that. Betty mentioned um, people feeling uh, fear of retribution from an assessor of, for like if you ask for a new case manager or whatever. Um, and that is a real, a real concern. I think if we can maybe hold on, remind me to get back to that after we talk about case management redesign. Um, but um, uh, well, I'll just say right now, our experience with how to deal with retaliation is the same way you deal with a bully. And that is to be loud about it and open about it. And that you tell more and more people, bring more and more people into the situation um, because that's the only way to stop it in our experience. Now I know that's super scary, but our experience is, but you know what, that the whole purpose of that power game is to make people feel ashamed and embarrassed and keep quiet. And that's the absolute worst thing to do. Um, but, the, and so to be super loud about it and often to address it up front and to identify retaliation is defined as a negative action following a complaint. It is prohibited in Medicaid law, um, but people, um, yeah, and pe people don't know who does what, which is part of why we're doing these so to help to, and, and this is a part of a series. So there's gonna be a whole training just on a new assessment once it's out. Um, we've not been trained on it yet. We, we're recruiting some people to be trained with us. And so this is a series of several trainings, but this is why we're doing this project is because too many people just don't know how it works and we need to change that. And so well, that's why we're recruiting our little army of advocates. There is, um, there is an org chart showing who does what, but because there are changes, it's probably best to wait on that a bit because it's going to change. But um, I think an org chart is certainly something we can develop showing what the system will look like. If you can go to the next slide, please. These are excellent participation and questions. Thank you. So after you qualify for home and community-based services, um, the case manager should work with you to develop a support plan. And then you have to have mandatory conversations with them. Um, there's, they do a check-in every quarter and that can just be an email um, or a call. And then I think there's some debate about if the six month one has to be more than that, but, um, you, they, it, but you also should let them know if you're not getting the services on your support plan or if the services are not of high quality or there's some other problem. Um, and they should support you in, in, in fixing issues related to long-term services and supports. They should also be able to refer you if there's something that comes up that is not in their realm. So for example, if you say my goal is to work full-time, well, they don't help with jobs, but the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation gets millions of federal dollars and some state dollars to do that. And they should be able to, um, they should be able to refer you uh, when something like that comes up. You can go to the next slide. Um, so um, you will get a copy of this and um, with links um, to, to give you to the HICPUF website. They have waiver charts and flow charts. Um, and they also have a glossary of all of these words and all of the services and what those services mean. You can go to the next slide. And anything, when you're looking at this, anything that you find confusing, let us know because we have, um, we're gonna be working on making some of this stuff more client friendly. And so if there's, if, if you go on the, the website and find uh, some document that you say, this just is gobbledygook, please um, reach out to Mona and give her the exact, the exact um, uh, link um, of what you're finding confusing and we'll put that on our list. Damien asked if the resource to, if there's professional development days for case managers to learn about community resources. And um, that's right now, that depends on each agency. I think that's something with the new system that we need to um, 
demand and have in there and, and have certain things that are always, always there. Now, the smaller agencies tend to know because the smaller communities, people do kind of all work together, but there also needs to be an expectation that that's um, shared. Um, and Mary, how do we get involved in the trainings? Yay, I'm so happy you asked. <laughs> Fill out the registration form. Um, and um, we will, um, and we will um, uh, be in touch with you um, on that. And we're also gonna send out a survey afterwards to at, again, ask people to please be involved. The case manager should also give you your rights and responsibilities as a member or client. And they shouldn't be doing anything about you without you unless you ask. Now, so I have, we have clients who have said, I want my mom and my advocate to do my plan. I don't want to talk about this anymore. But unless a client says that, um, then then they then you sh the client should always be part of it. And again, the client we can choose who we want involved um, in in the development of our plan. Next slide. Um, we have this in a handout. Um, so um, I'm gonna. Not we're running a little short on time, so I'm not going to go through this. But we do have rights. Um, we um, the, and again, we'll be um, providing that in a handout. Keep going. And we have and our, and our biggest responsibility is to be open and honest. So someone asked about appeals and grievances. So we also have the right, and I would I would venture to say the responsibility to file grievances and appeals when things aren't working because that's a formal way for the system to be able to track things. So people always say, what's the difference? A, an appeal is about what you get and a grievance is about how people act. So an appeal is, you, it's a formal process where there's an administrative law judge and don't let that scare you because there are people like CCDC and the ARC chapters that will help with that. Um, so it, it's a formal process that you can um, ask for for an independent, person to hear it, anytime a service is denied, um, reduced, terminated, or not acted upon with reasonable promptness. The ALJ is not paid by Medicaid, but the system is still somewhat conflictual because Medicaid gets to uh, look at things. Um, they get, they, it's a, I don't really have time to get into it. There, there are some conflicts in that process. We found it works fairly well though. Um, not, again, not 100% of the time. But um, there are some conflicts, but no, they're, they're um, I guess the money is all from one pot, but they're in a separate agency and they're paid by the Office um, of Personnel and Administration. Um, you also have a grievance is like some examples of when you would file a grievance. If you feel you were mistreated by the case manager, if there are quality problems and no one will help you, or if no one calls you back at all. Next slide. Um, and again, our responsibilities are to make sure that they know what's going on with us. Um, and again, we're going to send this in a handout, so I'm going to keep going so that we end on time. Uh, people have been asking questions as we go through, so I'm going to keep powering through. Um, who enforces the decision of the ALJ? Ultimately, it would be a court. Um, if, 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 if a decision happened and, and it wasn't abided by, it would be a court. And we work really closely with Colorado Legal Services and the Colorado Center for Law and Policy in the rare instances where we do need a, a higher level judge to help. So um, again, the current assessment only, the ULTC only determines the level of care for long-term services and supports, and then uses the supports intensity scale um, interrogation for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The new one will allow, we'll have one tool for both eligibility and services. It'll be longer, unfortunately, but more inclusive, longer than the ULTC, not the CIS. And it will finally be a way to get rid of the CIS. It also will make sure that everyone is asked and offered the opportunity to self-direct and to be told that employment is an option. No one's gonna be forced to work, but so many people don't even know that you can work and keep your Medicaid and we're gonna change that or that you can work and get supports on the job. Next slide. Um, so as we get into the algorithm, which we're gonna talk about next, um, current, yes. The, okay, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, we, have, we do have a question. And I'm, I'm trying to answer, but I'm not sure exactly. Who um, I, I answered that. Oh. 
um, yeah, it's the courts. Um, if Hickpath doesn't doesn't abide by it, it would be the courts. So right now, the and um, well, and I'll talk about what an algorithm is in, in a second. An algorithm is basically a computer program that spits out a dollar amount. And right now, only people in the IDD waivers have to use an algorithm, and that's that's called the SIS, which is again not transparent, and there's no meaningful exception process. And then the other system, what you get. Um, the other system is um, what you get depends on where you live. Um, so in some areas, people get told lots of good stuff and other uh, areas they don't. Um, and also kind of what you know, the new system, everyone's gonna have to use an algorithm, but it will be transparent and there will be an exception process and what you get will be fair across regions. And if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, and again, the goal is not to reduce services. Um, and so it, again, if that happens, we need to know about it immediately so that we can act collectively because that is not anyone's goal. Next slide. And um, we're gonna keep going. Um, and I guess we're gonna talk about case management redesign for a minute here. So in the current system, um, we've talked a lot about case management. If you have a developmental disability, you go to a community center board. And if you have any other kind of disability, you go to a single entry point and children are scattered between those. And also there's some private case management agencies that serve children. But we call it all a single entry point, right? So the change is that there's going to be a case management agency, one per region for all disabilities, all ages. Um, you can go to the next slide. So why are we doing this? Um, two reasons. One is the state has been required by the federal government and our own legislature for years now to have what's called conflict-free case management. So what does that mean? So let's say I'm a case manager and I do an assessment for Mona and it's determined that Mona need, wants to get homemaking services. And I say, oh, my agency provides that. Here, I'll set that up for you. Mona says, okay, she doesn't, you know, she's new at this, she doesn't know. So I set that up and then I call in for my quarterly and ask her how it's going. And she's like, well, the people don't show up very often and they're kind of mean, what do I do? Well, I, I'm now as a case manager saying, oh, um, the people that also work for my company, um, I'm getting a complaint about, that doesn't feel very good. Um, if, I, if I make a fuss about this or change, is my boss gonna be mad at me? Um, it might, the person who runs that program might be the woman who sits across the cubicle that's my best buddy who I have lunch with and I don't want to wreck that relationship. And I'm not doing any of this consciously. We're human beings. And we've got to remember that they're human beings that work in the system. So we have to have safeguards to prevent problems. So conflict-free means the people overseeing the services and telling you which agencies may or may not work for you are not employed by the same people that are providing the services. Um, and again, that's not because someone's bad or they're doing anything maliciously. It's just because, you know, the one, the one fatal flaw here, and I, I'm just being sarcastic, is that um, we're all human beings. The other thing is that HICPOP would like better accountability and management, and we want that too. So right now they have over 40 contracts they have to manage, and some are with the CCB that has certain they're, they're both the CCB and the SEP are both in statute. Sometimes the counties are running them. Sometimes it's public health. Sometimes it's a nonprofit. There are all these different permutations of what case management is. With the case management agency, HICPUF will be able to set, with our input, of course, our strong input, we'll be able to say, here are the expectations. Here is the contract. There will be a bid, hopefully competitive bid, and there will be clients and advocates on the committee that looks at the bids. Um, so, and then we'll be able to put in accountability features to say, here are the expectations. And if they're not met, then, you know, something's going to happen instead of right now, all they can really do is call and ask and kind of beg. Um, so yeah, it sounds great. Now, now to make it work, we have to be involved. We have to be willing and, you know, sometimes sitting on these committees, like particularly when you're like reviewing request for proposals is like really tedious. It's a lot of work, but we need to say what's important to us in case managers. It, Cause we're, we're probably not gonna get like every single thing we want, but you know, some great ideas were identified here. Like they should have mandatory training on community resources. Do we have in there an expectation that they know about certain things and if so, what things? What's a reasonable amount of time for a callback? Um, all of those things affect what goes into a contract and quite frankly, what they need to be paid. 
um, or what the state needs to pay. So all of those things are important and that's why we need a different system than what we have now, even though there will be bumps and change will be challenging. Um, the next slide, please. So um, when you say region, does this mean Denver region would encompass all nine counties? Good question. Um, there is something on the HICPUB website that identifies the region. I don't think Denver is all nine counties. I think, I think, um, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure because I haven't looked at that in a while that it's, um, well, I know it's not all nine counties. I don't know. I, I think it's Denver is one and then other counties are separate, but I'm not, I can't swear to that. We will send everyone the link to what the new regions are um, after this. And Mona will make a note to remind me to do that. Or I'm, not sure, to do that. I'm not sure clarify that the recording will be sent on an alert to, to all of our, our people not just the people in this meeting because we do not have an official list of emails for this meeting. Right, just the people who signed up, uh, who signed the sheet um, yeah. will get stuff. So um, so um, we're gonna move on to the person-centered budget algorithm. Um, and um, the so that again, that's gonna be a computer algorithm. And thank God we have this amazing parent um, who also was an engineer and she's volunteered um, with a lot, you know, nicely and kindly, but with a lot of us being very, very grateful. Um, and thank you, Mary. Yes, the, um, we will check that. And if the map is not accessible to blind people using screen readers, we will talk to HICPUF and they will fix it um, because that is an expectation. And HICPUF has actually been a leader in making things accessible. Um, John Barry deserves a lot of credit for that. So, but we will uh, check that before we send it out. Thanks for the reminder. I appreciate it. Um, so having, having someone who's an engineer and also a parent who knows the system, being able to like kind of look on the back end and understand those machinations is super helpful. Um, but we've also been promised um, transparency. So it's not gonna be some secret thing that you need a PhD in engineering to understand. We should all know exactly how this works because that's what transparency is. Um, the, um, so again, it's a step-by-step -step process that's programmed into a computer, usually for solving a mathematical problem. The idea of a person-centered budget algorithm ideally is that, and again, the way it's gonna work is we'll get the assessment automated, we'll spend a good year doing the assessment, then kind of apply it in a test way to see is it, is it working and then the algorithm is more like in 2024. Um, and I, I'm not saying that we're not, we're probably not gonna have to tweak things because it, this is new. Um, so, but that's why we need to just really be communicating to know what's working. So you should get a range of spending that should meet your needs. And again, there's gonna have to be an exception process which we've been promised because no one algorithm is gonna meet the needs of everyone. If it's done well, it should meet the needs of most. But again, the problem here is that we're humans, so nothing's going to be that perfect. Um, and yes, the definition of what works, what, when I say what works, I mean, people get the services they need to live their life. If that isn't happening in a way that lets them live their life, if that isn't happening, it's not working. It also, that, that, that people can understand how this, how this is working and that there aren't huge bureaucratic hangups. But, um, but as we go through, we might come up with other things that do or don't work. So thank you, Betty. Um, next slide, please. So algorithms can work well or they can be an absolute disaster. I've done a lot of, in the past couple of years, done a lot of studying of other states of what has, the states particularly where it has been an absolute disaster. And I found three things that have caused it to be a disaster in other states. One is it's managed care. A lot of states have managed care and long-term care, meaning there's some giant like uh, for-profit company like Anthem or United or someone um, running the show and possibly getting profits um, for this, um, for you know maybe for denying care or whatever. Um, in Colorado, we actually have in our state law that they can't use managed care for long-term care. But the state also has, is not interested in doing that. They, I think, know that it's not going to work. So, but in other states, it's been pro. It's been things like the CIS, or there's another tool called Interi that the advocacy community shut down years ago. That said, no, we can't use that, and that's why we developed our own tool 
is because we wanted, we didn't want something off the shelf where there was going to be proprietary issues. We wanted something that was public that we could all see and that could be transparent. So no transparency. And then the third thing that makes it a disaster is no exception process. So we, we have guarantees that none of those things are going to happen. That, does that guarantee it's going to be perfect? No. That the only thing that will guarantee, not, it's not going to be perfect. Nothing is. The only thing that will guarantee that it works is our involvement. Um, you can go to the next slide. And thank you for the offers to test. We will be recruiting that um, for that. So I know I went through um, a, a ton of stuff. One other thing I want to talk about appeals briefly, because I know that was mentioned. So um, I know people have been, there's been a lot of problems with the SIS uh, and appeals. And people are told that they can't appeal the SIS. It, this process, people will be able to appeal any reduction, reduction, denial, termination, suspension, failure to respond with reasonable promptness. And a denial means not getting what you asked for. So if you asked for, let's just say you asked for four hours of services a day and the algorithm says you get two and the exception process doesn't work, you can appeal that. So anything that is not what you asked for you can appeal. Now, if you ask for something that isn't even a Medicaid benefit, you're, th that's not really an appealable issue. But any, if you ask, if it's about what you, know, what you get and it's any kind of Medicaid benefit and how much you get, um, you can appeal those things. And so, but to, to really make sure that this works, we really need an army of advocates and we need a lot more people involved. Um, so I appreciate some of the offers and enthusiasm that I'm hearing here. So Mona's gonna talk about some ways that you can be involved. Um, and then we'll, we'll um, uh, finish up um, with, with any questions. And Betty, Betty just says um, uh, that some CCBs are using kind of fake quality control teams. Um, and one of the, to, to create a barrier, and that's part of, you know, when we look at the new case management redesign, some of the policy issues we need to look at are what kind of committee should they be required to have and who should be on them? How do we govern? Do we um, demand that, that, that in the governance, like the board of directors, that there's client and advocate involvement? Um, I mean, I think CCDC's position would be absolutely. Um, but, but, then, but, but even if we do that, that, that's not a guarantee either. We've got to be involved and report problems so that they can be fixed quickly because the state can only deal with stuff they know about and it's got, they, and quite frankly, they can only deal with real cases. So they, what, if we go to them and say, we're hearing a lot of complaints about whatever, um, it, it's very hard for them to deal with it if we don't say it was this, you know, this case management agency, it was clients in, in this waiver, or no, we're hearing this from all over the state and we have, you know, 15 people and they're from four different agencies and six different disability types or whatever. They, they need details. Um, so um, Robin says, currently you can waiver shop. Um, it, the, so yeah, this, thank you, Robin. I forgot to mention that earlier. So right now you, you can and you can't. You apply for a specific waiver and not everyone knows all of their, um, what all of the waivers they qualify for. So someone might have um, a brain injury, a mental illness, and a physical disability. And they would be um, eligible then for the brain injury waiver, mental health waiver, and the EBD waiver. But if the client doesn't know to ask for something, they could, they might also have a spinal cord injury. So they, you know, if the client doesn't say, I want this, um, or someone might have a developmental disability and a physical disability, and they'll not even be told about the other, depending on if they go to a single entry point or or a community center board. So the point, one other point of this is everyone gets the same assessment, then people are told about all of their options so that they can make an informed choice so that they can say, well, here's what you get in each waiver. What's, what's gonna work best for you? Um, and, and that's, I think, super important because right now you have to know a lot to be able to make a choice. And everyone, so if you're eligible for more than one, it is your choice which one you get. And by the way, we can change our minds. So um, the new assessment does not require you to change waivers. Um, so um, Mona, do, um, do you wanna um, put, um, talk about the different ways people can stay involved? Yes, thank you, Julie. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So for 
for any kind of change to work, um, people must be involved and people who are directly affected and need to be involved at all levels because we know our lives, we know our needs and we know our communities. And so I know there's been a lot of interest in how to get involved and what can you do. So here's a number of ways to get involved. So the assessment tool is currently our, our biggest um, project. Um, we do have case management, redesign, and person-centered budget algorithm will be later on. But the assessment tool to work correctly, it needs to be tested and reviewed by people who are affected by it. So some ways to, to get involved is to, um, number one, join an oversight or advisory committee for your local case management agency or case management agency or um, community center board. <clears throat> Another opportunity would be to watch for the opportunities to work with the state on the person-centered budget algorithm. As we, again, we wanna make sure it is fair and considers all the different disability issues and needs. I also want to mention that because this project is so big and so important to us that we've created a steering committee of leaders throughout the state. And out of that, we've created three subcommittees, the case management redesign, the new assessment tool and outreach. And uh, the new assessment tool subcommittee meeting is meeting next Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. So if anyone's interested, um, please contact me and I will get you all set up for that meeting. The case management redesign, I will be setting that um, meeting date and time tomorrow. And so again, if you're interested, please let me know. We also want to, um, we also will be um, training people, uh, a small group of individuals on the new assessment tool so they can train others. So again, please let me know if you're interested in that as well. Um, be your local long-term services and supports advocate for CCDC. Learn the new assessment tool in detail and help your peers get the services they need. This uh, will, we will be creating specific training for this. In the meantime, CCDC uh, has revamped their advocate training. And so our CCD's very own Lacey Stein will be doing the training and that begins on January 17th. Uh, the registration deadline is January 12th and we will put a link to that in, um, in the email that we sent out with the survey and other documents if you're interested or if uh, it is a six week class. So um, if you're interested or if you know someone who might be interested. And lastly, um, John Berry's constant contact list. Uh, that is a really good resource because he, he puts out um, an email about once to one to two times a week. It will have memos for uh, changes that are coming up. And um, it's, it's a very brief overview of the changes. Um, and then he'll have links for more information uh, if you are wanna learn more about that, those changes. And then underneath it will be uh, meetings scheduled. So for instance, a listening session or a stakeholder meeting, children's waivers, adult waivers, direct care workforce, it'll have the Zoom links, it will have a short description. So it's a really good resource uh, to uh, be, um, get on that list. Also, I want to uh, say that we are working on creating a specific website for this project. It has taken a little longer than we expected just because there's a ton of data that we want to add there without making it too convoluted. Uh, so, it will be announced soon as, uh, and it will go live. And I will have a ton of information, including uh, people's contact information and ways to get involved and all the documents that we shared today will be shared there too. Thank you, Jose. Um, so um, uh, so a, a couple of things. So, so uh, someone asked, what about Build Back Better as it applies to long-term services and supports? There is a whole, um, 
so build back better if it, if it passes, um, that, that will really help. Um, it'll put a lot more money into the system. And um, so we are strongly um, advocating that people, um, you know, continue to contact our, our representatives and say that we want this to happen. Um, because yeah, that's a really good point. In terms of the money we already got, there's a whole website um, that Hiccup has about all of, there's like I think 67 different projects for the, from the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, so a lot, a lot of stuff is happening. Um, um, we also, if you know other groups that might like a presentation, we have several more virtual ones scheduled. We also have community specific ones scheduled in Eagle, Mesa, uh, Morgan and Larimer counties. Um, but if there are other counties, e either like a county or local area or a specific group, like if people think, well, so like Denise just said, are you presenting this to CCBs? Well, um, no, we, we, we haven't. If there are CCBs or any group of people that want this, we would be happy to do this. Um, I want to thank the Next 50 Foundation. They are providing the funding that lets us do all of this um, um, and lets us dedicate time to this. Um, so if someone says it would be helpful if HICPUB had a regular conference call regarding the rollout um, for people. And um, they, they are, there are some meetings, but it, are you, if you're talking just about an update, we can certainly share that. We're also, um, again, our web, you know, that might be something that um, we, could, we could do. Um, so um, something that we could do or something, um, that we could ask them to do. There are the webinars that happen every month and we are updating on this project at those webinars, but that's something that we're doing jointly with them. And um, I think you get information about those by being on the John Barry um, list. So, um, so someone says how to support CCDC and Next50 Foundation with donations. Well, you can support us um, on our website and I'm sure the same is true of Next 50, um, and thank you for asking that. Um, we um, we do um, run on donations. Um, we so um, so we appreciate that. Um, and um, and as as people are talking about donations, I just this is not relevant to this particular training. I just wanted to give a huge shout out to the Association for Community Living and and uh, that serves Boulder County. Their response to the wildfires has been just absolutely incredible and very praiseworthy. Um, they're, they're set up to serve people with developmental and intellectual disabilities, but they actually reached out um, to me um, and said, if you know people with any disability who, who need something, we had a request for some supplies for a, a preemie infant. They responded within minutes. Um, they've just been absolutely amazing. So if you want to donate about the wildfires, I would strongly recommend uh, ACL Boulder, the Association for Community Living. Um, They've, again, just been nothing short of miraculous in their response. Um, so um, we have uh, seven minutes left if people have other questions. And I, again, I know we threw a ton of stuff at you. And I also know I, I talk really fast. So the, the, the recording will be available. You will be getting handouts. And please fill out the survey. Um, there are also, it, when you get the presentation, there'll be frequently asked questions. Um, and, and this presentation is accessible, so we, we have checked that. Um, there will be frequently asked questions that we will, that you can go over on your own. Um, and when you get the survey, please tell us how we can improve these. Um, this, I think, is our first, first or second virtual presentation. So we'd love to hear feedback on uh, how we can make this a better experience for people. And we really appreciate all of the engagement and participation. Um, and uh, with that, if there are no other questions, um, uh, we wanna thank you very much. Uh, the survey's in the chat. Um, I, I wanna thank everyone for participating um, and have a great rest of your day. Yeah. And Julie, I just wanted to point out my contact information here is on the um, second to last slide. And mm -hmm. I will be also sharing that information in the email that goes out with all the documents. Um, so Robin, Robin says about waiver shopping, the understanding is that you'll receive a budget and then choose a waiver. I actually don't know um, if, I, I don't know if which comes first, but um, that's a good question. I'll have to find out about that. I, I don't know that it should matter. I mean, if we actually do this fairly across systems, 
I don't know that it should matter, but it might matter, um, especially with the residential component. So. The um, chat, the chat yeah. will also be saved. Okay. So people, this will be saved uh, publicly to, to people who are interested. Um, yeah. Um, thank, so I just see a, a, that says um, for the Alzheimer's Association, most likely for people with Alzheimer's, it would be the elderly, blind, and disabled waiver is the one they would qualify for. Um, um, the, so, um, uh, so I see I was on a group that tested a new assessment maybe a year ago, raised a lot of issues. Um, I know that... Um, I know that the issues that we were aware of, that those of us who are advocates who were part of that group, those did get resolved, but I agree there was like a lot of silence after that. Um, what we've been promised is that the changes that we, that we were advocated for have not been undone. But again, once we actually see the tool, we'll know what was and wasn't resolved. And if there are things that weren't resolved, we'll need to get those things changed before, um, before any, any kind of permanent system gets in place. So thanks for raising that. And again, that's that's um, really um, really important to make sure that this is right. And and the state has delayed things several times, which has been frustrating in one way, but very nice in another to know that um, it's it's more important to do this right than to do it fast. Even though it's been very slow, it's still more important to get everything right first. Um, will there be more case managers? The assessment will be portable. That's another benefit. Um, um, I don't know if they're going to be more. There probably will have to be more case managers because this is going to be more. It's going to take more time. So they're going to need more case managers or to reduce other duties. Um, but there are also things that they won't have to enter stuff in six different places like they do right now. So, um, so I'm not sure like how much more, but there probably will be more. And, and with more accountability, there might be some more turnover. Um, hopefully we'll have you know, pay that, that's commensurate with what they're expected to do also. But that, that's, where, that's why the case management redesign and the assessment are really interrelated and have to be thought of together. So thanks, that's a good question. And yes, Betty, you're right. In the meantime, the CIS is hurting people. You're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. The funding will not be regionally determined. Um, it, I mean, it, it, you know, the case management is paid on a per person per month basis, or sometimes per like per assessment. So it won't be like that. This, and I know, I think where you might be going, Darla, is are people in higher cost areas gonna get more funding. I don't. I think that that's something that's being talked about and thought about, but I don't think there's a concrete plan to deal with that at this time. Um, and uh, okay, well, that's one of, so Trace says, what about case managers that take a lot of time off? We, we've had complaints for years about whole agencies that where everyone takes Fridays off, for example. Um, and, um, or, you know, people being gone for weeks at a time with no one to cover. Those are some of the things that we need to put in the new contracts of, that you have to really be customer service focused. And so it's not just about, um, not, not just about um, what the staff want. I mean, you wanna keep your staff happy, um, but may, so maybe some people can take Fridays off and other people, and then maybe you have people working Saturdays, um, but not everyone taking Fridays off. Um, Someone asked if all the links are accessible in one place. Um, Mona, are they? I, I don't. You're on mute. Mona, you're on mute. Um, yes. So they should all be accessible. We'll check on that before we send those out. And we'll be in sending one place. Them or do in we one... have to... Okay, you have a document with all the links. I right? have a document, yes. So we'll okay. be sharing that. Great, thank you very much. I thought so, I just wanted to be sure. Um, so when doing a CIS review, when or should you do the long-term care review or assessment? Um, it, right now, there isn't an assessment to do. Once the assessment is rolled out, um, 
that'll be what's available. Um, so I, I think there will be a period of time though, if you need a budget change before the algorithm is in place, you probably have to do the, um, the CIS review. Um, and so I don't know when you say long-term care review or assessment, they're kind of the same thing. So um, um, the rolling out of the new assessment is gonna happen in 2022. Right now they're looking at April. Um, and again, our you know, with everything going on in our world, you know, the changes, it changes, but they're they're really hoping to to do to start this in April. And um, we really are looking forward to kind of hearing people's feedback as this goes on. And again, if, if you know of other folks that you'd like to ask for a presentation, we are happy to do it. We'll also send the dates of the additional presentations. Um, well, the, the new assessment addressed current paternalism and the bureaucracy. Um, no assessment's gonna fix all of the problems. We did work really hard to have a more strengths-based attitude. And the, I think the fact that employment is gonna be discussed in every assessment does that to an extent because it's always been, it always been that like, working was kind of considered this thing that people with disabilities don't do and shouldn't do and can't do. And also looking at consumer direction as a norm, not as an exception. But we'll, I think uh, the, the paternalism is a very big culture change that's gonna take more than a new tool um, to deal with and, and is gonna be, and is and has been long-term. I think over, you know, if we look back, I remember when we started, um, uh, consumer directed um, services. Um, when we started the idea back, passed the legislation in 1996, the person who was running things for Hickcliffe then said, no one's ever gonna let clients run their own services without a nurse. And, uh, sorry. Um, and obviously that hasn't changed. Um, Linda, I'm happy to answer um, that the assessment isn't based on a diagnosis, it's based on your functional needs. So um, that, I, like, I, I don't know what the height is, but it, that alone probably would not qualify someone for a waiver. They would need to need help with activities of daily living. Um, and so it's much more function-based than diagnosis-based. So, um, again, I wanna thank everyone for participating um, today and, um, and for, your, um, for all of the engagement and involvement. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Feel free to reach out to Mona if you have follow-up questions, she'll get them to the right place. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Julie, for all your help. Bye. <laughs>